this case one wire is in the atria there is a second wire which is going in the ventricle we are getting input and on basis of the input when i say the word sensed you see the triple d mode it is what is being paced both the atria and the ventricle which are being sensed again both the atria and the ventricle and by dual mode i mean both inhibition and triggering would be a Hey guys, welcome back. This is Dr. Marva, and today I'll be talking about aspects related to a pacemaker before you. Just like in a ventilator, you read about various modes like ACMV or SIMV mode. Similarly, when you do questions related to a pacemaker, you would be reading about these various modes like a triple D, or lots of time you would read about questions talking about complications like pacemaker syndrome being seen with VBI mode. So the objective of today's discussion would be to simplify what these basically these modes mean, and to explain that I'll be using the NASPE VPEC code generator. What I mean by that is North American Society for pacing and electrophysiology i mean you very well know americans and british they not only decide the geopolitics but they also decide uh, aspects related to electrophysiology for us so i'll just uh, for the sake of uh, highlighting this pe would here signify pacing and electrophysiology and b would stand for british pacing and electrophysiology group so based on this uh, i'll be able to explain to you regarding these various modes that i was speaking about then i'll explain to you indications uh, complications that can be seen and a very interesting thing that would come up would be cardiac resynchronization therapy which is uh, mainly useful for patients who are having medically refractory congestive heart failure now if you have listened to my discussion of congestive heart failure i have highlighted that especially those patients who are having cardiomyopathy especially dilated one or restrictive cardiomyopathy they might be requiring a cardiac transplantation but it is easier said than done because obviously you need a donor for that so pending a cardiac transplantation for patients who are having medically refractory congestive heart failure the problem in the heart is that both ventricles are not contracting simultaneously both ventricles are contracting a little i would say off sync with respect to each other which contributes to pulmonary edema you see in you and me both ventricles should contract simultaneously that's what maintains the stroke volume but in patients of chf because that's definitely not happening so what we can go in for is a biventricular pacing and that biventricular pacing is what is called as cardiac resynchronization therapy as we progress in the discussion you will become more comfortable with the facts but why i highlighted this spot on is because traditionally you read about pacemaker for bradyarrhythmias so yes we going to talk about pacemaker being required for a symptomatic patient of snod malfunction or it could be complete heart block or morbid to heart block definitely yes but you will also read about pacemaker being used in patients with respect to you know a slight tweaking in the technology i would say when we use the word biventricular pacing casually or we use the word cardiac resynchronization therapy not for a bradyarrhythmia but for a person who is pending a cardiac transplantation this is a cardiomyopathy patient who would be required this technology and would definitely be able to at least prolong his life now obviously you will be getting a lot of x rays in your exam as well and when you look at these x rays or fluoroscopic images that might give you you would obviously be able to visualize that some part of this is obviously the battery and patients are very interested in battery life per se right so the superior part is is the circuitry here present uh, and this can definitely be affected by magnetic fields so people who are having a pacemaker specially implanted uh, on the left side just below the left clavicle infraclavicularly in a pocket they would be advised not to keep their cell phone in the left breast pocket obviously now we have uh, devices which are resistant to magnetic fields but just uh, as a precautionary measure i would like to highlight the fact that when these patients go for a uh, airport security check you see at airport security they might be using a metal detector and that will again be using a magnetic field and uh, therefore that can interfere with the functioning of a pacemaker or can change the mode like it could be a triple d mode and the pacemaker gets switched to a a double o or a v double o mode then obviously i mean this can contribute to problems for the patient so a lot of patients who are having a pacemaker we'll give them a i card saying that these patients are having a pacemaker deployed and they are exempted from uh, i would say the the Uh, the mag the handheld metal detector primarily i mean uh, a physical security check of this person can definitely be done 
Now, as I said, the battery life, so this is usually going to be in the range of about 10 years and uh, well, we can limit the battery life by uh, keeping the heart rate of the patient in the range of about 50 to 60. Now, I know at this point of time, a lot of you are going to say, sir, the definition of the word bradycardia is about less than 60. So when you're putting in a pacemaker, why are you not keeping the heart rate at more than 60? One point is obviously that 50, 60 is compatible with life, no issues. You would have seen a lot of hypothyroidism patients, a lot of athletes who would be having heart rate between 50 to 60. And second, what I want to highlight is that the higher the lower heart rate limit that I set. I mean, if I keep it on the lower side, I'll be able to conserve battery life for a relatively longer duration of approximately 10 to 12 years. But if I set this limit at a higher higher threshold, let me say in 70s or 80s, then the battery life will definitely reduce. That is why you lots of time in the textbook, you might read a range between anything between 6 to 12 years. So that's why I put up an answer here of approximately 10 years. And the lower limit of heart rate and the upper limit of heart rate can definitely be determined with respect to to a pacemaker and uh, we will now talk about the various types of pacemaker with respect to one the duration part i mean it could be a temporary pacemaker it could be a permanent pacemaker or it could be with respect to the chambers that are paced so one of the highlights is and just follow my marker at the moment this is the pacemaker the wire which is going here or the lead that is going here is ending up in the right atrial appendage so what I'm talking about is a single lead pacemaker where the wire goes and touches the right atrium Another possibility is, follow my marker once again, the wire would go and touch the right ventricular endocardium. Now the initial pacemakers that were made, we usually had a wire going to the right ventricle and the thought process of everybody is that after all SA node is present in the right atria, so why are you sending the wire down to the right ventricle? My point is, I can obviously send two wires. One would be going in the right atria, another would be going in the right ventricle. That is called as dual pacing. But first, I want to highlight the fact that if you get a question with respect to a single lead pacemaker, then uh, in a single lead pacemaker, in the options, you would be having even right atrial appendage written and right ventricle also written. So what would you select? You would select right ventricle. Why? Because of the fact that after all, one of the basic functions of the heart is to send blood to the lungs. So if you can control the right ventricle, one of the basic optimal functions of the heart is being performed, sending blood to the lungs for oxygenation. Because suppose I try to control the right atria, and then the problem is tomorrow, if the AV node malfunctions or the bundle of will malfunction in the patient, then all my hard work is lost. So in a single lead pacemaker, most of the time, I mean, uh, I can just highlight this here as well. There would be a wire that would be going down and touching the right ventricular endocardium, though it can obviously end up in the right atrial appendage as well. Now, most of the time in the exam, because they give a lot of x-rays where the pacemaker leads can be seen and these leads can obviously get dislodged as well. So I'll just use two different colors to highlight these two different leads and you could be having a lead fracture a lead malposition which could obviously contribute to problems for the patient like in this uh, particular uh, uh, schematic diagrammatic representation i've shown two wires one in green and the other one in blue so one is landing up in the uh, right atrial appendage and the second one is uh, in the right ventricular endocardium and that obviously uh, would give more credibility because if you are able to control uh, the activity of both the chambers of the heart you see my point is atria contribute 30 percent to the ventricle filling so if you can coordinate that first atria should contract, then ventricle should contract, it definitely makes relatively more sense. And you would have all done this multiple choice question a lot of times that uh, uh, dual pacing is recommended for all patients of third degree heart block. Now in this discussion, I'm not focusing on the bradyrhythmias per se. So there's a separate lecture in the app for that. So I expect you to have listened to that because here we are mainly focusing on the NASPE BPEC code and I mean, which kind of a pacemaker would be required for which particular scenario. I also want to highlight, in fact, uh, let me just uh, draw uh, these wires again so that it becomes more comfortable for you to understand. So the blue one is ending up in the right atrial appendage. Then uh, I'm going to show a green one that's going to end up in the right ventricle of the patient. Now, uh, please follow my marker very carefully. I'm going to show another lead. I'm just going to zoom it in for your convenience. 
uh, this lead is actually I mean this is only a diagrammatic representation it's not that I am causing any septal perforation it's not that I am uh, going in via the interventricular septum this third lead that are shown in color black is actually lying in the coronary sinus because after all all the wires of the leads are threaded through the veins I mean you go via the subclavian vein then you go up to the brachiocephalic superior vein AK and into the heart so this particular lead has been threaded into the coronary sinus and what this lead is doing is it is controlling the left ventricle so now you can see you are controlling the three chambers of the heart the right atria that's the blue one the green one that's the right ventricle and you are also controlling the left ventricle not directly by sending a wire into the left ventricle but rather into the coronary sinus and we obviously are having three leads there we can also be having quadripolar leads that is what you read or understand by the word multi-site pacing so those words multi-site pacing will obviously come up sequentially but I want you to remember for multiple choice questions per se that whenever you read this term and listen to the words very carefully cardiac resynchronization therapy CRT then you are having two wires in two separate ventricles one in the left and one in the right so most of the time if you are having a patient of cardiomyopathy it could be dilated it could be restrictive and the patient has gone into congestive heart failure with where the ejection fraction is very low I mean something in the range of 20% which will definitely cause extensive problems for the patient that is his dyspnea grade by New York Heart Association uh, grading would be something like grade 3 or grade 4 then these patients would be definitely benefited because you are going to coordinate the contraction of the ventricles normally in cardiomyopathies what happens is the two chambers of the heart the ventricles beat independent of each other so somehow if we can force them to beat at the same time or if you can electronically control them to beat at the same time you would be having is a definitive improvement in the patient so in this particular slide i have described to you regarding a pacemaker with respect to the chamber space i have not at the moment focused on whether it is a temporary pacing or a permanent pacing i'll do that in subsequent slides i am at the moment simply focused Focusing on which chamber is being paced only the atria is being paced only ventricle is being paced both are being paced or is it the right atria right ventricle and the left ventricle controlled by the coronary sinus which is what is called as CRT over and above this I want to add an additional fact for which I have not put a diagram but I'm just saying that during cardiac surgery they might even decide to put a pacemaker to control the heart not from inside but from outside so we can also have a epicardial that is from the outside of the heart a epicardial pacer as well but this is primarily restricted to usage in CTBS and the usage of that is definitely reduced per se so we can be having a single lead a dual a CRT and then epicardial pacemaker out of which most of the time the questions that you would get with respect to the placement of the leads would be the ones that I've highlighted now let me just uh, go ahead and highlight that when you are going to send a wire or a lead into the heart it will obviously need placement so there are various uh, ways by which it can actually be fixed I mean it could be a screw mechanism into the endocardium or it could be like wing tips by which it will secure itself so why I showed this slide is mainly to explain to you because lots of time I will be using the word like lead dislodgement or a lead misplacement so obviously after putting in a pacemaker we will restrict the physical activity of the patient initially at least because I don't want these uh, wires to get misplaced and they start uh, uh, causing problems in fact problems can be extensive enough to have a septal perforation if you have a septal perforation that will contribute to uh, maybe a VSD being created or something like a VSD being created or if they cause a cardiac perforation this goes through and through then you could even be having cardiac tamponade developing in a patient so towards the end when I talk about complications then the, the these uh, diagrammatic representations would definitely make sense because complications like septal perforation or cardiac perforation definitely can occur. We will now be focusing on whether we have a permanent pacemaker or we have is a temporary pacemaker. So in the previous slide, I described to you a pacemaker with respect to which chamber is being paced. But obviously the duration part will also matter because lots of time you will read about a temporary pacemaker or you will read about a permanent. In fact, the permanent word is a misnomer because obviously it's not for whole life. It depends on the battery life. I mean, you are going to replace the battery subsequently. The point is temporary pacers would definitely be required in what scenarios? Temporary pacemakers would be required where the person would be very very sick and one of the important multiple choice question where he would definitely like to ask you about temporary pacemaker deployment is inferior MI. You very well know that in inferior volume MI it could be vagus that could be activated so the heart rate of the patient will dramatically reduce so for this you will initially give atropine but following atropine if the heart rate is not increasing it's still in 20s and 30s so I would like to increase it by going in for a transvenous pacemaker so additional information 
information coming up here. Uh, previously, I spoke about the chambers being controlled. Now I'm talking about a transvenous pacer being used, uh, which would primarily help you in patients of inferior myocardial infarction. Now, as it happened in the exam, you can very well see uh, in this particular diagrammatic representation two leads. Uh, I'll just uh, highlight uh, one of the leads here. You can see that it is going down and then slightly curling upwards. So this is the one which is landing up in the right atrial appendage per se. And now let me just trace the second one. The lead, this one is going in the right ventricle of the patient. So uh, if they give you an image like this in the exam and they ask you like uh, what kind of a pacemaker is present here. So this would be a dual lid pacemaker. You obviously can see the battery present here. You definitely can see the electronic circuit present here. And uh, obviously, as I explained, I mean, magnets and uh, pacemaker don't gel together a strong magnetic field could change the mood of the ventilator it could go from a triple d mode to a asynchronous mode and because of that patient can definitely have problems so we will tell these patients to as far as possible avoid devices which would be having a strong magnetic field and you very well know from your radiology classes as well that uh, agree to the fact that it's a relative contraindication but still i'll just highlight what the radiologist would have said that uh, mri is not recommended in patients with the traditional class of pacemakers obviously if you invest more into technology you would be we are having pacemakers that you know the person can undergo mri as well but for question's sake you need to remember that uh, this would be definitely be a relative contraindication now uh, i want you to remember at this particular point of time that uh, if they say what is the site where you would be putting in a permanent pacemaker because a temporary pacemaker or transvenous pacemaker is simply going in via the great veins into the right ventricle or touching the right ventricular endocardium but if he says in the question where do you put in a permanent pacemaker then uh, you would be putting it on the left side of the chest infraclavicularly there's a pocket which is created obviously that pocket get, get infected so when i talk about complications i'll talk about uh, pocket infection with respect to a permanent pacemaker and uh, in female patients obviously it can be put behind the breast as well but it would be superficial to pectoralis major i want to highlight this fact that uh, the deployment of a pacemaker will take approximately one hour would be done under uh, fluoroscopic guidance and uh, well patient will not have any significant discomfort we'll obviously sedate the patient monitor him for a while and uh, he would be on his way we are also nowadays having wireless pacemakers so that's again a very interesting field that is coming up because here i'm talking about all the wires now the technology has gone down to a wireless pacemaker which is deployed directly in the right ventricle per se that's a miniaturized i mean it's much much smaller than this particular pacemaker which you can actually feel you know just below the skin it is present in a subcutaneous pocket so uh, definitely i mean uh, uh, when it comes to technology there is nothing limiting it but in indian patients budget is always a constraint so we need to keep that in mind and I also highlighted before you the fact that uh, uh, there could be, you know, an image based question where they might actually just give you a scenario of a person having an inferior MI and they might just give this image where you can see a temporary pacemaker. Uh, this would be powered by the routine AA batteries. I mean, the one that I'm showing for temporary pacemaker, I'm not talking about the traditional lithium ion batteries being used. A traditional AA, double, AAA batteries can be used to power this and you would be having a wire going down to the right ventricle. So, most of the time, the scenario that would be given to you will be that of an inferior mi and i've spoken about tvp now i say a very interesting thing you can see in this particular image two paddles on the chest of a person so these two paddles on the chest of the person are with respect to an automated external defibrillator now i wanted to remember that not only a automated uh, external defibrillator can terminate a pulseless ventricular tachycardia or it can uh, terminate a ventricular fibrillation but nowadays you are having automated external defibrillators which can even hand highlight handle a bradycardia now listen to these details very carefully i said aed will obviously terminate a tachyrhythmia but the inbuilt system in this can also handle a severe bradycardia. Like suppose the heart rate of a patient due to any reason is only 40 or 30 and the BP is going towards unrecordable. The pulse is just palpable, barely palpable. So what this device can also do is deliver a shock to the chest. But this shock will not terminate any arrhythmia because it's a bradyrrhythmia, no? So what I'm describing to you at the moment is called as TCP, that is called as transcutaneous pacing. So mark my words there. Earlier I was saying TVP and then is a TCP, a transcutaneous pacer. And we obviously have transcutaneous pacers separately also available, but they are inbuilt into a AED nowadays only because obviously you will save money if you have a single device and they can do both the functions. So do remember the fact that AED can handle a tachyrrhythmia as well as a 
some bradycardia with a pulse. Obviously, I would not like to use this if there's no pulse present in a person because if there's no pulse, the heart rate is, let me say, down to 10 or 20, then obviously a transvenous pacing and then subsequently, I mean, uh, further interventions in the form of usage of drugs will make more sense because this guy could be simply having a cardiac arrest subsequently. But the point is, if you're having a person with bradycardia with a low cardiac output, pulse is just thready, pulse is just palpable, then TCP can also work for the patient. So described in this particular slide per se, two types of temporary pacing to you, that's going to be TVP and a TCP, and both are described in the protocol of symptomatic bradycardia. So go through that lecture as well, that will make you more comfortable with this discussion. And then permanent pacemaker, obviously the leads would be threaded via uh, the, the bigger veins under fluoroscopic guidance into the chambers which I highlighted in my previous slide where you could be having a, a single lead, a dual pacing or a CRT or in, uh, I also highlighted regarding a epicardial pacing. Now when it comes to uh, uh, ECG based questions in the exam, uh, I mean every time you are getting an ECG based question especially with respect to acute coronary syndrome in a patient, uh, obviously you are supposed to scan the whole of the ECG but I want to highlight that lot of questions that you get in the exam would be having findings in lead number 2, 3 and AVF because uh, that is what we are most likely to miss. All of us tend to focus on the findings in the chest leads. We tend to focus on uh, V1 to V6 but lots of time in the exam you might be actually getting findings of that classical uh, ST segment elevation with the convexity which is highlighted in this case. I mean the traditional party sign is coming up uh, or I would say the the tombstone pattern is coming up and the ST elevation in this case is more than 2 millimeters. So this definitely, I mean, uh, the way I've described it before you, I want to highlight a patient of STEMI of the inferior wall is admitted in the hospital and he would like to ask you two things about this from the question perspective. One, he'll obviously talk about the bradycardia component in this patient and he'll say, what is first line treatment? That's definitely atropine. The dose of atropine has changed, guys. I hope you remember from the AHA 2020 guidelines. It's not 0 0.5 milligram at the moment. It's 1 milligram and you can give maximum 3 dosages. Earlier, it was 0 0.5 into 6 dosages. And if this is not going to work, you can obviously upgrade to TCP. That is a transcutaneous pacer. If it is not available, obviously, you will have to go in for a TVP, a transvenous pacer. And the second aspect of inferior volume MI that they love to ask is always with respect to low blood pressure. IV fluids are not given in any other type of MI. IV fluids are never given in anterior wall MI because there's a pulmonary edema. But the only MI where you give a fluid challenge to a patient, listen to the words carefully, only MI where you give fluids to a patient of MI is inferior wall myocardial infarction because you want to increase the right ventricular preload. So definitely because this discussion is not only with respect to the NASPE BPEC code, but ultimately we should be able to solve questions also. That is why I have specially gone into this. We shall now be talking about indications for putting in a pacemaker. So I will be talking about uh, level of evidence class 1 indications primarily. Uh, there's a, obviously a slide present here which talks about class 2A and class 2B as well. But uh, in the exam mainly they will ask you about class 1 indications. So let's get on with it. The older term was sick sinus syndrome. Nowadays they simply use the word SA node dysfunction. Uh, it could either be a, uh, I would say, a possibility of sinus exit block or it could be sinus arrest occurring in a patient, especially in a geriatric age group patient, if uh, there are symptoms present. So that's an important aspect. If you have a younger patient, he's having minimal symptoms or no symptoms, you definitely would not be pressing on the requirement of a pacemaker. But a symptomatic chap with the SNO dysfunction, yes, it is on. Now, the second indication would be a patient having a third degree heart block that is also called as complete heart block, which is very characteristic of, uh, uh, I would say, having an AB dissociation where the ventricular rate is lesser than the atrial rate. I mean, normally the atrial and ventricular rate is okay, but in third degree heart block, atria would be doing 80 times per minute or would be working 80 times per minute. A ventricle would be operating with help of Purkinje fiber or bundle of phase, so would be working around about only 40 times per minute. So AV dissociation because atrial ventricular rate is not matching. Uh, if a person is having a third degree heart block and even if the person is asymptomatic uh, because there's a high probability that he will develop sub symptoms subsequently, he will develop postural hypotension, then uh, these patients irrespective of the symptoms per se should definitely be advised uh, a pacemaker and it has shown obviously benefit. Uh, even if a person is having a second degree heart block, uh, uh, important aspect coming up here, you are aware of Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2 heart block. So Mobitz 1 does not require pacing. 
it is movements too that will be requiring pacing and again the point is even if the person at the movement is asymptomatic he will become symptomatic subsequently so the message is in point number one i said only for patients who are symptomatic that i would advise but in third degree heart block or second degree heart block movements too even if person is irrespective of the symptoms you need to go ahead with this the third one will look very peculiar to you atrial fibrillation now atrial fibrillation is a tachyrhythmia no for that if atrial fibrillation is occurring on a recurrent basis i will be deploying a implantable cardioverter defibrillator because a pacer is for patients having a bradycardia whereas if a person is having recurrent tachyrhythmias i would deploy a icd but here i mentioned if a person is having atrial fibrillation with a high grade av block simultaneously present then that's again a class 1 indication for deploying a pacemaker apart from class 2 and class 2b unlikely to be asked in the exam so mainly you need to remember these three and i've shown one more ecg here where if you count the heart rate of the patient it is dramatically very less in fact uh, in this particular ecg i can count something in the range of about nine large squares uh, which are separating the r and the r waves so the heart rate of this patient is something in the range of because nine threes are would be something like uh, 27 so something like 33 34 beats per minute the cardiac output of this patient is very less and I'm not able to pick up any identifiable P wave before. So this patient is classically having a SA node malfunction, SA node dysfunction and uh, assuming that this person is 70, 80 years of age then definitely a permanent pacemaker is required for this person. So we now come to the most awaited part of this discussion that is the NASPE BPEC code for a pacemaker generator function. So lots of time you read about these codes like triple D or VVI. So let me just explain what they mean. Uh, I would like you to remember a mnemonic by the name of PSR so that you can understand these codes relatively better. So alphabet P is representing the first alphabet in it, it basically means what is the chamber that is being paced. Now what I mean or imply by the fact that what is the chamber being paced it could either be the atria that is being paced. It could be ventricles that could be paced or it is a dual mode that is both atria and the ventricles could be paced as well. Alphabet S would stand for what is the chamber that is being sensed. So it could again be only the right atria is being sensed. You see there are two things. When I say sense it is the input and when I say paste it is the output because it's an intelligent device so it can get input from the chamber of the heart and based on the input it can deliver an output as well. So it could be sensing of the atria, sensing of the ventricle, it could be dual or we could just temporarily switch off or uh, the alphabet O here would mean that the, uh, the facility at the moment has been temporarily disabled as well. So if I say the word DDD three times, then the first time that D is meaning that it is the chamber, both the chambers of the heart are being uh, paced per se, that is the output. The second alphabet highlights the fact that I'm getting input from both of them. I mean, that's that's a highly evolved mode. No? I'm getting input from, based on that. I'm generating output. And the third letter basically means type of response being sensed. Now, what I mean by the type of response being sensed is it could either be inhibitory mode. I mean, if there is going to be a normal electrical activity of the heart, then the pacemaker does not need to do any particular job. So therefore, the pacer spike will not be seen. Otherwise, the pacemaker, what it does is it triggers an activity. The point is, uh, we need an intelligent pacemaker. We don't want it to continuously keep on firing again and again and keep on delivering pacer spikes. We want it to realize the fact that if the heart can work on its own, let it be. Don't force the heart at that particular point of time. So we have an inhibition mode, we have a trigger mode and we obviously can be having a dual mode. So you can obviously, the triple D mode will definitely make relatively more sense. The fourth letter though is not routinely used is basically based on ability to vary the heart rate of the patient. Uh, you see like in your mobile also no, you would be having an accelerometer. That uh, accelerometer in your mobile or you can download an app nowadays in your mobile and it will tell you know, how many steps did you walk today and what was the average speed of walking especially in iPhone no, these facilities are available how many steps did you climb every day so the same kind of technology of an accelerometer can be put even in a pacemaker so the pacemaker can adjust the heart rate of the patient dependent on the physical activity like when he's climbing stairs you see your heart rate would slightly increase even if you climb stairs slowly your heart rate would slightly increase because you're putting in an effort so if you put in an accelerometer which is getting input that okay patient is doing some kind of a physical activity which could be like going up an incline or climbing stairs then there would be an increase in the heart rate or, or the minimum threshold of the heart rate which is delivered by the pacemaker so i can just put in the word rate modulation you don't need to remember the fourth letter per se because usually it is not mentioned or even if i mean 
द फोर्थ लेटर आई मीन द बेसिक पॉइंट इज रेट मॉड्यूलेशन शुड आइडली बी प्रेजेंट इन ऑल द मॉडल्स दैट आर अवेलेबल सो फोर्थ लेटर पर से विल नॉट डिसाइड द परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ अ पेस मेकर बिकॉज दिस इज समथिंग विच इज मिनिमली रिक्वायर्ड and then the fifth letter is with respect to multi site pacing now for this uh, most of the time books don't say much but uh, let me just explain to you what it means by the word multi site pacing if you are listening to me carefully in the earlier part of the discussion i had spoken about cardiac resynchronization therapy i had told you one wire will be going in the right atria another one in the right ventricle another one will be in the coronary sinus and the one in the coronary sinus will be controlling the left ventricle but left ventricle is very big now left ventricle itself is very big so what i can do is that in the coronary sinus instead of placing single electrode i could be deploying two electrodes that means the total number of electrodes deployed in the heart are four now one in the right atria one in the right ventricle and two in the and two in the coronary sinus so i am going to call it a quadripolar pacing and when i am doing a quadripolar pacing it will obviously eat into the battery life it will eat away into the computing power because if you are going to try and control more chambers of the heart then in those circumstances you will consume more battery so multi site pacing is usually not recommended or it is used uh, in lesser scenarios i mean obviously it will require a electrophysiology residency or uh, eps lab uh, residency to understand the all technical intricacies behind it which you do in your obviously dm cardiology post times but my objective here is to you know simplify things at a undergraduate level as well or at at a pg entrance level as well so what i want to say is that uh, what you need to remember for the exam ultimately is the first three letters with respect to the description like when i say triple d mode it means that both the atria and the ventricle are being paced are being sensed and then subsequently i mean it could be a dual mode where inhibition and triggering would be occurring so let's have a look at uh, some of the ecgs that would be coming especially with respect to a triple d mode which is very frequently asked and uh, this is what is usually recommended if a person is having a uh, sa node malfunction with a av node malfunction you see in geriatric patients in old age they could be fibrosis in the sa node and it could extend into the av node so you are basically having a useless uh, intrinsic conduction system so if you are having a useless intrinsic conduction system it would definitely make sense for you to actually deploy a triple d mode and let me just explain what i mean here with diagrammatic representation so in this case one wire is in the atria there is a second wire which is going in the ventricle we are getting input and on basis of the input when i say the word sensed you see the triple d mode it is what is being paced both the atria and the ventricle which are being sensed again both the atria and the ventricle and by dual mode i mean both inhibition and triggering would be occurring so in a triple d mode now let's see what's going to happen subsequently in the patient uh please follow my words very carefully look at this ecg i'm going to say here because the atria have contracted you can see the p wave occurring normally the qrs complex occurring normally so i'm saying the fact that the pacemaker did not generate a pacing spike there is no pacing vertical spike you can see a vertical spike of the pacer no this is what you see as pacer spike present in all ecgs of patients who are having a pacemaker there was no pacing spike detected because this is a intelligent computer it could understand that the p wave has occurred at the qrs wave has also occurred at a predetermined time or at a particular time interval so i'm writing the word a sense v sense to highlight the fact that both atria and ventricle have been sensed by the computer so it did not deliver any impulse per se but now if you look at the next complex you can see that the atria did contract on time so the atria was sensed by the computer but then you can see that there is a fairly prolonged pr interval you know it's exceeding 200 milliseconds so because the computer did not detect the ventricles it delivered a ventricular spike and it did a ventricular pacing so the word i'm writing here is a sensed v pace what i imply by that is uh, that the atria contracted on their own because the p wave activity occurred by itself the intrinsic uh, activity of the heart was sufficiently able to deliver it so i wrote the word a sensed v pacing because the ventricles did not contract on time so v pacing now look at the third complex very carefully you can one once again see a pacer spike in this case and after this pacing spike you can then see a p wave present and then you can see a second pacing spike and then after that you can see this rs complex present this is a relatively a broad rs complex that you can see after a second pacing spike so the words that i'm writing here to describe is this is a paced why i'm saying a paced is because the atria did not contract on time so the computer took over this is the computer taking over this is the the pacer spike that has occurred in this case so the computer took over so a paced 
and then I'm gonna write the word vpaste to highlight that uh, well the ventricles were also forced to contract but look at the fourth complex very interesting this time the pacer spike did definitely contribute to atria being controlled by the pacemaker so I'm writing a pacing but ventricle was able to contract on its own so the word is a sensed uh, I would say in fact it might look a little technically difficult for you but see the permutation combination that I've created I'll just say that fast initially just to you know uh, impress you a sense v sense that means everything is working fine but if I say a sensed v pacing it means when I say a sense atria are okay but ventricles did not fire so the computer delivered a ventricular spike I have made permutation combinations here before you four of them before you in fact this is the most advanced type of pacing that you can see in the entire discussion that I'm uh, sharing before you because dependent on the input whether atria is working or not whether ventricles we can program it okay read the PR interval if the PR interval I mean there's a P wave but there is no QRS complex if the computer is gonna analyze okay there's no QRS complex I'll fire a pacer spike and make the ventricles contract so there are four permutation combinations that I've created before you I, I'll just highlight them before you a sense v sense a paste v paste right totally diametrically opposite of each other when I say a sense v sense it means everything is okay the heart was allowed to do its own activity when I say the word a paste v paste it basically means nothing is okay neither the atria contracted on time neither the ventricles contracted on time so the computer decided to intervene that's in the third complex so if you can just take a snapshot of this ECG and analyze this data by yourself all the markings that I put you would be much more comfortable understanding why the triple D mode is recommended in patients who are having SNO dysfunction most of the time this is associated with a complete heart block as well now let's you know just downgrade a bit instead of a triple D mode I'm gonna change the mode to VVI what do I mean by the word VVI is that V here means that it is the ventricles that is being paced it is the ventricle that is being sensed but there is only one mode that is occurring that is inhibition there's no triggering activity that is occurring in this case now uh, based on this uh, let me just send up a wire here right this is the pacer there's a there's a wire which is going in the ventricle right single wire it's not a dual pacing this time because I wrote the word V V I again so it means only the ventricle input and output is being regulated atria we are not concerned about so let's look at I'll, let me just zoom into the ECG so that you can uh, see this much better the vertical lines that are present here are called as pacer spikes now you can see a pacer spike and then subsequently it was able to cause a RS complex the ventricles were made to contract again subsequently there's a pacer spike and there's a RS complex occurring so the ventricles were made to uh, contract properly luckily I mean why the inhibition mode is coming up is because subsequently it was able to detect a normal sinus rhythm so the computer decided not to fire a pacer spike you can see no pacer spike present when it was able to detect but the problem with this particular mode is that you are allowing you are regulating only the ventricles you are not bothered about the atria you see atria contribute 30 percent of the filling of blood in the ventricles and god forbid if the pacer spike is delivered at the same time when the atria are contracting let me highlight this once again if the pacer spike is delivered at the same time as where the atria is contracting then there would be lack of coordination because both the chambers will contract simultaneously and that will result in pulsations in the neck of a person so lots of time they will ask you in the exam which pacemaker mode will be associated with high level of AV dissociation then this is the one which we are talking about at the moment the VVI mode is responsible for what is called as pacemaker syndrome the meaning of the word pacemaker syndrome is you are controlling only the ventricle you are not giving any attention to the atria so if the atria and ventricle contract together that is when the patient will be having the following problems you would obviously be able to see you know the pulsations in the neck of the patient that is fine but along with this because of lack of coordination there would be shortness of breath that would be experienced by the patient the pulmonary edema component can come up along with this there could definitely be development of uh, chest pain why because again the the output from the heart is lesser so if the output from the heart is lesser remember there's a lack of coordination so if the output of the heart is lesser the coronary blood flow will also be lesser so this will contribute to you know a reduction of coronary uh, coronary blood flow can cause a coronary ischemia from developing in a patient along with this uh, pulsations in the neck and fluttering sensation in the chest uh, why I want to highlight these pulsations in the neck is there's a separate video of mine on YouTube itself on prep ladder by the name of frog sign so I have described frog sign with respect to AV dissociation only but today I'm talking about AV dissociation especially with respect to the word pacemaker syndrome 
So lots of time the questions would be asked to you with respect to this particular statement of mine that is pacemaker syndrome is commonly seen with which mode the answer is VDI mode and you will say what would you recommend for this patient so switch over to triple D mode where both attention is being given to the atria as well as the ventricles if you give attention to both the atria and the ventricles you see after all both are two important integral components of the heart then obviously the productivity or the performance of the heart will definitely be improved so you need to remember both the aspects that i've highlighted before you and vvi mode can obviously be used in patients with a complete heart block as well but because of this disadvantage this is less recommended and triple d is what you usually see we shall now talk about a voo mode where v alphabet would mean that uh, this is the ventricle which is being paced but when it comes to the sensing part the sensing part is turned off and similarly when it comes to the response part the response is also turned off i want you to remember the mnemonic i mentioned psr that is which is the chamber being paced which is the chamber being sensed and what is the chamber on uh, on basis of which the response of the pacemaker is being generated so in this case uh, i want to highlight that uh, uh, you are turning off or disabling temporarily obviously you can switch between these modes you are temporarily switching off the sensing and the response mode now let us see what really happens in this particular case there's there's a single wire that's going down into the right ventricle we are not bothered about whether the right ventricle whatever input it is giving you you are just delivering output to the ventricle that is you are telling the ventricles okay keep on contracting so you can see that regular pacer spikes are coming up here you can see regular pacer spikes which are coming at about 4.5 large square so every 900 milliseconds now i've already done the counting uh, before i actually came for this discussion before you so i'll just zoom it in for you what you can see here is about 4.5 large square separating every pacer wave so what we are doing is simply telling the ventricles to keep on contracting again and again we are not bothering about the fact that whether the ventricle is contracting on its own as well so see what happened uh, I'll just put a vertical line here this is the pacer spike which resulted in a ventricular contraction good no problems then there was a P wave present but because after a P wave there was no QRS complex the the pacer should have actually fired at an earlier time but it did not because we had programmed it already to fire at a predetermined interval so this is a very i would say primitive method of controlling the heart because all you're making it contract is at a predetermined time there is no coordination once again the atrial contraction has occurred and you're waiting 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 and then there's a ventricular contraction occurring and look at what happened subsequently very interesting i'm just gonna zoom it in for your convenience you can see a pacer spike but the pacer spike in this case has been delivered right after the qrs complex Ideally, the pacer should have switched off. The pacer at this particular point of time should not have delivered a pacer spike, especially with respect to when a normal sinus rhythm is present in the patient. You can see a P, you have seen a QRS complex and still a pacer spike is being delivered. If this pacer spike was delivered a little later, you can see it is at the end of the S wave. So the heart was in absolute refractory period. When the heart is in absolute refractory period, luckily they did not cause a problem. But then I think all of you are aware as doctors that the middle of the T is where the heart is most vulnerable. The middle of the T, if you read Gillong physiology, it says the middle of the T wave is where heart of the half of the heart is depolarized, half of the heart is repolarized. If any impulse lands on the heart at the middle of the T, it can result in development of ventricular fibrillation that is called as R on T phenomenon. I want to highlight the fact that if you give an electrical stimulus to the heart, bang in the middle of the T wave, that's called as the vulnerable period of the heart. You know, somebody you punch somebody in the chest and the person dies. Why? Because you delivered the punch right at the peak of the T wave when the half of the heart was depolarized, half was repolarized and the patient landed in ventricular fibrillation. That is what is called as commotio cordis. There's a separate lecture on commotio cordis or the aspects of that that I've discussed in the app primarily. So you can listen to that. But why this pacemaker mode is not very good is because the pacer spike was delivered just before the peak of the T. It was, it was in the heart was an absolute refractory period. So luckily ventricular fibrillation did not occur. But if God forbid, this pacer spike would have occurred bang in the middle of the T, the patient would have landed in ventricular fibrillation. So this is definitely not a very good mode. So you're going to be using it only as a temporary mode. And that too, with respect to uh, when a patient is undergoing surgery, it could be cardiac surgery or it could be non-cardiac surgery. Uh, mainly VOO mode is used 
you know you switch on from a triple d mode to a vo mode mainly to prevent electrical interference from a electrocautery you see the electrocautery device can generate uh, el electrical signals and that could be misrepresented if the pacemaker is in a triple d mode so to prevent electrical interference that's the statement i want you to remember uh, from a electrocautery for example that is why a v double o mode would be recommended you can see that uh, why it's a primitive mode is because luckily the complex in this particular ecg that i showed before you landed right at the end of the qrs that was refractory period had it been a r on t phenomenon a ventricular fibrillation could have occurred in a patient we next talk about a aai mode where alphabet a would mean that uh, this is the chamber the atria is the one that is being paced atria is the one that is being sensed so input and output both are being regulated you are paying attention only to the atria here not paying any response to the ventricles and uh, i would mean the inhibition mode is there if the atria can contract on their own then the pacer will obviously not deliver a pacer spike so what you can see in the middle at this particular point of time is that the atria were able to contract on their own so there is no pacer spike but just before that because the atria did not fire on its own there was a pacer spike followed by a atrial contraction that is occurring so this mode will mainly be suitable for those patients who are having a exclusive problem not in the ventricles but only in the atria because after all you are regulating only the atria you are taking uh, only the atria into consideration so if he says what is an indication for a aai mode well this would be a s node malfunction i have already highlighted to you that s node malfunction can be associated with the av node block in a single patient so what will be best recommended that's the first thing that i told you a triple d mode but if in the exam he says person is having only a s node malfunction without a av node problem then it's definitely a double a i mode that can be used in the patient coming to the last mode that's called as vdd mode but the question of mind to you is quickly tell me whether this would be a single lead pacer or would it be a double lead pacer as i told you you need to work out this is uh, the chamber that is being paced that is ventricle but uh, then when i say the word dual it means the fact that the sensing that is occurring is occurring of both the atria as well as the ventricle so it means it's a dual chamber pacer in this case i'll just draw two wires one is going in the right atrial appendage the second wire is going in the right ventricle now all you are doing is you are controlling the ventricles that is what you are seeing here only the ventricles are being regulated if they don't contract they are being forced to contract but you are getting input from both of them that is both the atria as well as the ventricle so this would be one step below the triple d mode which i highlighted initially so let me just go back in my slides and highlight the various modes which are highlighted from the exam perspective if they ask you you need to be very comfortable with these four permutation combinations that have created i mean a person who's having a combination of a combination of a uh, sa node malfunction as well as av node malfunction is a triple d mode if he says pacemaker syndrome would be commonly seen with answer is vvi mode the reason as i explained was you was you were trying to control only the ventricles you did not give any attention to the atria so the atria will say i will create problem for you both the atria and ventricle will contract together that is pacemaker syndrome all about and uh, well it's better that uh, we also remember voo mode that would be primarily with respect to a temp procedure being done with respect to a patient undergoing any kind of surgery to prevent electrical interference from various devices when you read the word aai the word a basically tells you atria on the top and in the atria the problem is in the sa node so that's why the isolated s node malfunction the word is isolated s node malfunction a vdd mode would again be required for patients who are having a third degree heart block and then subsequently we'll also talk about what are the various complications that can be seen following a deployment of a pacemaker so i'll go in a sequence that what can be seen early and what can be seen late uh, one of the bigger problems that can anyway occur especially with a temporary pacemaker in a hospital setting can be because you are doing it under pressure you see uh, in a in, in a casualty uh, there could be compromise on the hygiene component because the person is having a bradycardia following an inferior volume i so if the hygiene part is not followed obviously a local site infection can occur uh, in a elective procedure like a permanent pacemaker obviously the chances will be relatively lesser primarily because uh, um, more importance to the hygiene part would be put then because you are taking a excess via the subclavian vein uh, the the leads of yours could damage those blood vessels and can contribute to a pneumothorax and in fact uh, if there's a trauma to the subclavian vein it could also translate into a hemothorax developing for the patient so both complications are to be marked as yes both a hemothorax as well as a pneumothorax the fourth complication that could be occurring with the endocardial lead could be a development of a septal perforation or they could even be a cardiac perforation 
in fact uh, that would be a real nightmare or a worst case scenario because that will contribute to cardiac tamponade and uh, how do you pick up cardiac tamponade you all know that that would be uh, ECG showing electrical alternance where the amplitude of QRS complexes will definitely start varying. Apart from this there could be a lead malposition so a lot of these patients could be coming to you with chest wall twitching. Uh, this is either because the voltage being delivered or the current being generated in milliamperes is rather on the higher side or it could even be a malposition of the electrode per se in the in the chest or there could be lead fracture as well. So whenever you read about I mean chest wall twitching it implies the fact uh, that the lead is malpositioned or the lead is fractured. Uh, in some cases he also describes uncontrolled uh, hiccups in the person. This is because the pacemaker lead is uh, delivering electrical impulses to the phrenic nerve that is to the diaphragm uh, in fact i'm just writing the word uh, the pacemaker is also causing a phrenic nerve pacing and phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm of the patient so you will read in the literature with respect to continuous hiccups occurring in a person or chest wall twitching occurring in a person that obviously will require extensive workup to be done and the problem is to be fixed then you will read about a peculiar situation. Uh, this is called as twiddler syndrome. You see there's a subcutaneous pocket here. If you are having like you know some, some uh, uh, swelling present here. I'm not saying a swelling that came naturally. This is a swelling which is done after a surgical procedure because there's a device present here. So some patients will feel irritated and they'll keep on manipulating it. So twiddler syndrome basically means that the patient manipulates the generator and he causes damage to the leads because after all the leads you, you saw in the first slide the leads were attached to the circuitry so because of the patient manipulation he is feeling irritated or he might just say I am having continuous itching in this area where there is a pacemaker present so continuous manipulation of the site per se can contribute to uh, damage patient manipulation of the electrical circuitry can contribute to a malfunction of the pacemaker that's a rare thing but definitely I mean that's given in the literature so we need to study about it we, that's called as twiddler syndrome then I have explained about what is called as pacemaker syndrome. Uh, in this particular case there is a definitive AV dissociation occurring. So there would be fluttering sensation in the chest, discomfort which is experienced by the person and this is very common with VVI mode, less common with the triple D mode which I have highlighted before you. Then you will also read about pace, pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy. This is very common with single lead pacemakers. Uh, nowadays we obviously use dual lead pacing but in case of a single lead pacer what will happen is that the pacer will mainly give first impulse to the right ventricle. Impulse will reach the left ventricle later. You see, you are stimulating the right ventricle immediately, the left ventricle is being stimulated later. So the ECG of the person will start giving manifestation of left bundle branch block. So the point of mine is pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy implies that there is a bundle branch block manifestation which is occurring in a patient. So don't confuse the word pacemaker syndrome versus a pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy because that's mainly seen with a single head pacemaker and there's, there's a definitive problem with respect to a bundle branch uh, block being mimicked in the person. Uh, once the pacemaker has been deployed, obviously the follow-up of the patient has to be done. Uh, it's two weekly initially for the first one month, then from one year to three years, it's usually four weekly and then you can call the patient eight weekly as well. And uh, well, the battery life, uh, uh, the, the battery life does not get depleted immediately. I mean, the query of a lot of patients is what happens if the battery gets finished? Well, we have is an electrophysiology lab. So just like you get servicing of your car done every few, uh, you know, uh, after every few thousand kilometer, uh, we are running the service backup for your pacemaker you need to come to our hospital and we are gonna evaluate whether there's a problem with the battery and we, we can definitely replenish that as well so it, it's a short procedure after all but uh, the objective of the discussion was uh, mainly to sensitize you to these various modes and uh, because obviously patients have also become more demanding exams have also become more demanding so I've tried to handle uh, this uh, complex topic which obviously requires extensive amount of uh, inputs on uh, a doctor part but I'm great that you're hearing me right till the end and I'll definitely be seeing you with another discussion uh, very soon please like and subscribe the channel uh, I know you've already done that if not please do that and uh, I, I, I'll be back with another discussion very soon thank you so much for your patience and hearing me out